Welcome to the third episode in a Legendarium series about Russia's Time of Troubles. In part three, An Ocean of Blood, we will talk about how Russia's civil strife turned into an international war. In 1607, magistrates arrested a well-educated vagabond for impersonating a nobleman. Under torture, he recanted his claim to be this or that boyar, and instead claimed to be the lost Prince Dmitri, who died more than 15 years ago. The officials, likely sensing a chance to seize power from the weak Tsar Vasily, unchained him, cleaned him up, and proclaimed the vagabond to be the true Tsar of Russia. The Poles, still eager to install a flunky on the Russian throne, agreed that the second false Dmitri must be the true prince. Patriarch Filaret, likely sensing that the wind blew towards Poland, agreed to recognize him as the rightful Tsar. As the Poles plunged into Russia once more, Tsar Vasily fled Moscow and established a government in exile at Tushino, only a few miles from the capital. Before he left, Tsar Vasily released Marina Minsech, widow of the first false Dmitri, from prison. He likely hoped to weaken the second false Dmitri's claim to be the real Tsar. Instead, Marina wisely defected to Moscow and publicly proclaimed the second false Dmitri to be her formerly dead husband. Growing desperate, Tsar Vasily asked for help from the Swedes. Sweden controlled most of the Baltic region, including Finland, Latvia, and Estonia, even ruling some parts of the Ukraine. Poland, determined to keep their man on the throne, sent an army into Russia to thwart any Swedish invasion. This had the unexpected effect of turning the Russian boyars against the second false Dmitri, whom they now saw as yet another foreign flunky. Dmitri, with his entourage fleeing to join the Polish army, wisely joined them. Meanwhile, the Cossacks of the South saw the chance to become rich at Russian expense. By 1608, they began raiding the Volga River. They showed appalling cruelty to the peasants. Cossacks burned houses to the ground and chopped people into pieces with their cavalry sabers. Whole villages vanished in clouds of smoke and gouts of fire. Any animals who could not be taken would be slaughtered and left in bloody heaps to attract clouds of flies. Survivors fled into the vast ocean of grass around the edge of the steppe where they died not long after the first snows. Indeed, the Cossacks found their own candidate for the throne, whom they proclaimed Petr, the previously unknown Tsar, son of Tsar Feodor. It almost seemed to be a mockery of the endless procession of czars. Yet the Muscovites grew so desperate that some boyars actually headed south to join the so-called Tsar Petr, but the cruelty and brigandage of the Cossacks so appalled them that they returned. By 1610, both of the main contenders for the throne had died. A boyar council, disgusted by Tsar Vasily's inability to end the Russian nightmare, simply deposed him. To keep him from ever ruling again, they forced him to become a monk and sent him to Poland. The man who ruled as Tsar of Russia for a time spent the rest of his days as an anonymous brother in a Polish monastery. Meanwhile, the second false Dmitri abandoned Moscow and took up a new base in the hinterland. Despondent and fearful, he grew increasingly bad-tempered and paranoid. He began scolding and beating his followers with frightening frequency. One day, he went for a sleigh ride with a Tartar flunky whom he had flogged for an imagined offense some days ago. While Dmitri drank himself into a stupor, the Tartars shot him in the back and collected his head as a souvenir. No, Russia had no Tsar. Its closest semblance of a government became a huddle of frightened boyars who proclaimed themselves a Duma. 
Now a third false Dimitri emerged among the Cossacks, but the Poles soon captured him and gave him a public hanging in Moscow, which they now controlled. Even the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Filaret, became a Polish prisoner hundreds of miles from Moscow. With the leader of the Romanov family in exile, his teenage son Mikhail became the leader of the family. Yet since no effective resistance remained in Russia, the Poles shifted their focus from Sweden to Moscow. Confident enough not to bother with the fig leaf of a fourth false Dmitri, King Sigismund III of Poland simply declared himself the new Tsar of Russia. Only Sweden, which still occupied the Baltic coast, objected. After all, King Gustavus II of Sweden wanted to make his brother Prince Philip the new Tsar. With Lutheran Sweden and Catholic Poland poised to divide Russia, it could have led to another round of bloodletting as they dragged Russia into Europe's religious wars, which already turned Germany into a charnel house. Is there any end to Russia's time of troubles? We will find out in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this installment of The Legendarium. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.